Australian Vietnamese actor, director, choreographer, Taekwondo black belt, Maria Tran, has worked alongside A-list names Jackie Chan, Jason Stratum, and Tim Roth. But most of the characters Tran auditioned for in the early days were unnamed characters, Asian woman, tiger wife, sex worker, Japanese girl smelling underwear, Vietnamese mother running in a field, giving her baby away to a white woman, then getting blown up, twice. Growing up in Australia, Tran learned martial arts as a child to combat school bullying. In her Adelaide performance of action star in this year's Oz Asia Festival, Tran combined world-class stunts, weapon-wielding, explosive choreography, and fighting skills, to pull back the layers of Western culture to battle ideas of gender stereotypes, identity, politics and racism and one woman's journey to be recognized in a world of struggle and adversity. As Asia's first Asian-Australian artistic director Annette Shanwa, is a film director with a long history in the radio, TV and film industry. Nominated for an Australian Film Industry Award in 1996, Shanwa also recalls being frustrated with the early, frequent acting job offers for waitress in a Chinese restaurant. As Asia has showcased Asian-Australian artists in the festival in Adelaide, South Australia, since 2007. Aiming to foster collaborations with international partners, Shunwa says with more people writing these days, stories are richer and more nuanced, offering different perspectives and insights from the lived experiences of a range of characters. More diversity on stage and screen also creates a social and cultural shift in attitudes that see Asian Australians as more than sex workers, drug couriers, or gangsters. When Jackie Chan offered Maria Tran a job working with him in China, Tran said no. No, I want to be like you, but I want to make my own films, for the next generation of filmmakers. Action star Tran also talks about the Me Too movement and how she felt the ripple effect with Asian Australians, as well as broader audiences. Her own experiences of a meeting in Hong Kong, after which she was blacklisted by the Weinsteins, left her feeling powerless. It's rocking Hollywood tonight. Tran says she eventually found work on her own terms in Australia, where she thought, screw the system, just do your own thing, and in 2018 she founded female-led company Phoenix Eye Film Production. Tran continues to work on film projects as well as teaching and training emerging talent. The experiences of Tran and Shun Hua are not isolated. A multicultural nation, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the first inhabitants of Australia, here for thousands of years prior to colonization, and almost half of Australians with a parent born overseas, Australians have started to ask, who is telling Australian stories? And whose stories are being told? Are women adequately represented in key creative roles and positions of influence in the Australian screen industry? If not, why not, and what can we do about it? In 2015, Screen Australia announced a three-year, $5 million plan for gender matters, a suite of initiatives and programs to address the gender imbalance within the Australian screen industry. But Screen Australia's initial gender matters response ignored the dynamics of deeply ingrained patterns of injustice that see those with power benefit from maintaining the status quo. Research finds the lack of equity for women in film is caused by identifiable networks of men, however social and political systems still parrot that the key problem lies with women themselves, for example, in cliches like women can be equal if only they believe in themselves. In 2016, Deborah Hooven, at the time professor and chair of media and communication at Deakin University, used the technique of social network analysis to observe how the film industry operates as a series of creative networks in which male-only or male-dominated networks thrive. Men predominate in key creative roles. Films with male producers have, on average, creative teams that are 70% male. Films with female producers are 60% male. Criminal network analysis, typically used by police and counterterrorism agencies to identify how drug cartels and terrorist networks come together and how they can be most effectively fragmented, is an associated technique of social network analysis that Verhoeven used to analyze how specific male producers maintain networks and cohesion of male dominance by working exclusively with male creatives. Across a 10-year period, Verhoeven's infographic shows that 89 men in the dataset worked exclusively with other men in key creative roles. That's around 40% of the total number of male producers. Verhoeven thinks understanding how male-dominated networks operate is the key to disrupting them. With this understanding, evidence-based interventions can be made in the film industry to fragment male-only creative teams. Of course some of these men may have worked with women in other parts of the industry, television or commercials for instance. Or they may have worked with women who have not been credited for their contribution. 
But also, around 30% of the films made by these male-only teens were predominantly about men, with a male pronoun in the title, The Railway Man, Cedar Boys, Son of a Gun and The Boys Are Back, just to name a few. And more than 75% of the male producers in the industry worked on films during this 10-year interval with only one or no women in key creative roles. Clearly, writes for Hooven, male dominance will not decline until there is a different distribution of the film industry's finite resources, one that is based on reducing the number of men, rather than by using equity measures to just add women onto existing production teams. Gillian Armstrong, Australian director and 2016 recipient of Cinefest Oz's Screen Legend Award, believes there won't be equality until there are as many mediocre women directors as there are mediocre men. Armstrong has heard the resentments of male directors who feel shut out from funding opportunities, but insists the industry is tough for anyone. The women that have got through over the years, Jane Campion and, and Jocelyn Morehouse and so on, have worked 10 times as hard as the men. They're 10 times as good as the men. Cinematography is another example of a male-dominated role. A July 2022 report released by the Australian Cinematographers Society into the camera workforce revealed a diversity deficit in camera-related fields, where there are no First Nations women, and only 2% of people are transgender or non-binary. The report found that inclusive growth was not encouraged. The workforce is whiter, older and more male-dominated than the general workforce population, and men get the more prestigious senior roles. Harassment and bullying of women came up in the survey, but those experiencing it were afraid of consequences if they reported it to employers. A key area of gender discrimination in the ACS survey was money. Women aren't working on larger budget productions, and the greater the budget, the fewer females are participating. It also found a serious gender pay gap. This was not explained by experience or qualifications, but one of the reasons was that women undersold themselves and often asked for lower fees. According to Grace Moore, Sydney Morning Herald reporter, as production budgets increase, the likelihood of having even one non-male person in the camera department decreases. First Nations, people of color, queer and gender diverse cinematographers are relegated to the fringes, on lower budget projects, with fewer opportunities for paid experience than our majority older, male and white counterparts. This kind of exclusion is cyclical and it affects their ability to progress onto higher budget productions, ultimately creating the long-term income inequality underlined in the report. I think it does come down to women and gender-diverse people not being trusted to take on these bigger budget projects, emerging director of photography and focus puller, Nissa Mitchell said. Film and television production in Australia is a major, growing sector, driving cultural, economic and employment activity and its global film and television production sector is rapidly expanding. In 2010-2011, just over 500 million Australian dollars was spent on 81 feature film and television drama projects in Australia. By 2018-2019, total expenditure more than doubled to over $1.2 billion, and the number of feature film and television drama projects had risen to 115. Poor representation of women in creative and business leadership roles, directors, producers, writers, distributors and exhibitors, still exists despite research, Policy interventions and affirmative action programs intended to increase representation and create gender parity in the screen industry. Programs designed to increase representation of women at the supply end of the value chain have been quite effective, with film schools today having around 50% gender equity among graduates, with more and more aspiring female composers, writers, directors, producers getting the opportunities they deserve. What is not shifted is the number of women leaders at the demand end of the value chain. That is, exhibitors, distributors, sales agents, investors, and broadcasters that drive the business and decide what should be programmed on our cinema and television screens. These are the people who green light projects and approve the key creatives on any project. We need to take the argument up to these men, and they are overwhelmingly male for anything to change. How do we achieve this? By demonstrating that having more women in positions of leadership will be good for audiences and for the bottom line of the screen industry. By convincing screen business leaders that there is a business case to include more women in key decision-making roles. By showing screen business leaders that there is talent within their organizations and behind the camera that is currently being overlooked. By demonstrating that there is potential for market growth by making more films that appeal to women. Women buy more than 50% of all movie tickets and women 35 plus are one of the only demographics that continue to grow worldwide at a time when cinema audience numbers are trending downwards. In fact, Female-focused films such as Fifty Shades of Grey, 
grossing 547 million US dollars worldwide, and The Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 1, grossing 752 million US dollars, have been credited with rescuing the looming downward projections for US box office in the year of their release. It is absurd in the face of this market demand that year in year out, less than 25% of all films in the market are about women or have female protagonists. When financing The Dressmaker, 2015, directed by Jocelyn Morehouse, producer Sue Maslin chose Universal Pictures because it was the only distributor at the time who would talk to her seriously about the female demographic as a commercial market. Most films with women directors have female producers. Male producers overwhelmingly work with male directors and are not taking the risk on engaging women directors. Why not? Basic psychology, male decision makers, and they are mostly men, in a high-risk business environment feel more comfortable backing people they have affinity with, that is, other men, on stories and genres they understand. In Australia, it is very unlikely that a woman will get to direct a film unless she has at least one female producer on board. In fact, in the past five years 90% of women directors had female producers. Distributors, sales agents and investors want to be careful where they put their money and will repeatedly select projects with male protagonists and male directors. When financing The Dressmaker, Maslin found that even with Kate Winslet and Judy Davis, the film was considered too high a risk for international buyers. In a film about a woman dressmaker targeted primarily to a female audience, the exclusively male sales agents and buyers needed A-list male actors to secure the sales estimates. So who is actually taking the risk on women's stories? For a start, female directors are. Their films are overwhelmingly about female protagonists. But according to Screen Australia statistics, they represent only 16% on average of the total number of directors at work in Australia. Worse still, this figure has not shifted appreciably in decades. There is no silver bullet solution and many strategies need to be put in place to address the problem. Promoting female talent and reducing the number of men in key roles will have an impact. If the whole industry is to grow into the future and prosper, it cannot ignore the untapped creative talent and leadership potential of women. It's time we adjusted the set.